extraordinary developments as the Wagner Group uh, march towards Moscow, having fought in Ukraine. Their leader, Yegevny uh, Prigozhin, is furious. He says that he's been let down by the Kremlin, that his men are dying unnecessarily, and he is sick and tired of the incompetence uh, that is putting lives at risk, he says, and he is marching towards his own capital city. Meanwhile, Russia is responding. We're seeing explosions. We're hearing that they're bombing the Wagner Group as they march through Russia. It's about uh, 300 miles to the Russian capital. And uh, even more, uh, just bizarre almost, they are setting up machine gun posts around the outskirts of Moscow, ahead of what is expected to be a battle, a battle on the streets of the Russian capital. This is extraordinary. Is it the beginning of the end for Vladimir Putin? Uh, let's talk to defence analyst Colonel Simon Diggins. Uh, good afternoon, Simon. Good afternoon, Kev. How are you? Uh, I'm all right. Uh, well, your thoughts on what the hell is going on over there? I mean, as I, ca I can't stress this enough, this is extraordinary, isn't it? It is. I think it shows some of the fundamental weaknesses of Putin's government. The century all autocracies uh, rely on some networks of people who will support the regime. But if one of those bits of the network decides to fall out, and that seems what's happened with uh, Prigozhin, then then this is this is the kind of thing that can happen. Now, where it will go to and where it will end is still very difficult to say. But there's undoubtedly been, and there has been for months now, this very, as you say, virulent attacks by him on the leadership, normally trying to pretend there's a distinction between Putin and the leaders of the defence uh, community in, in Russia, but increasingly uh, even then suggesting that Putin himself had no grip on what's going on. So there's, in a sense, there's a logical end to some of that talk that we've heard before. Uh, let's have a listen to Putin's speech today, which again, I keep using this word, but it was extraordinary. Let's, uh, I mean, it's in Russian, but uh, we'll talk about it afterwards. Uh, take it away, Vlad. И наш тим, и наш народ, и нашу государственность от любых угроз, в том числе от внутреннего предательства. А то, с чем мы столкнулись, это именно предательство. Непомерные амбиции и личные интересы привели к измене, к измене и своей стране. The thing about this speech, Simon, was uh, it was unexpected. It sounded as if it was on the hoof. He wasn't really talking from a script. Yeah. He talked about being stabbed in the back by Prigozhin. He talked about uh, this being an act of treason that would be punished in the utmost. But what I thought it betrayed, I thought he looked pale and nervous and it betrayed, I think, on his part, a tremendous anxiety about what's going on. No, I, I agree with you. You could even hear it, the sort of catching the voice without understanding the, the language. You could hear that kind of, that sort of hesitancy and, and, less, uh, and lack of kind of confidence that what's going on he can control. I mean, I think the difficult thing to, with, to reflect on is, of course, is how close um, the uh, Prigozhin was to him. He was his personal chef. He's also from St. Petersburg, and I think that was one of the great connections for Putin. Mm -hmm. Putin's very much a man from uh, Petersburg, St. Petersburg, Leningrad, as it originally was, and he basically trusts people. And at the end of the Soviet Union, he went back to, uh, to St. Petersburg, uh, allegedly became a taxi driver for a while, but certainly he kind of reverted to hit that would be his local power base. He then became the leader in St. Petersburg, and then the rest if so, is history. So this is somebody from his home background who he trusted absolutely implicitly who has stabbed him in the back. And that clearly has affected him very deeply. So uh, Yegveni uh, Pogozhin uh, is known for his furious temper. Extraordinary story, again, that word again, extraordinary, but he has yeah. had uh, uh, an almost unbelievable life. He did nine years in jail for common theft. He was just a thug and a thief, uh, took to selling hostages hot dogs to tourists with his family, uh, started to make some money, went into the grocery business, set up the first uh, chain of grocery stores in St. Petersburg, went on to set up restaurants, and that's where he came into contact with uh, Putin because his restaurants were very flash. Putin started having his birthday parties there, liked the food, as you say, Prigozhin became his chef uh, and then became his chief mercenary. Uh, let's uh, have a little uh, listen again. Of course, it'll be in Russian, but you'll get the picture. Let's have uh, a listen to Yegevni uh, Prigozhin in all his thunder. Take it away, Yegevni. 
Это чьи-то, блядь, отцы. И чьи-то сыновья. И те, блядь, которые не дают нам боеприпасы, сука, будут в аду жрать их потроха, блядь, Well, I'll tell you what, Simon, I wouldn't like to meet him on a, a dark night on a Saturday night or something, but uh, he, he's, uh, what he's raging about there is his forces, the Wagner group, uh, basically a bunch of mercenaries, uh, they've been fighting in Bakhmut, which is like the third city of the Donbass, and yes. he's saying, you, you know, you, you promised us weapons, we haven't got weapons, uh, my men are dying. This is the source of his fury, that uh, he says that Kremlin incompetence has cost the lives of his men and he's had enough. Uh, what do we know about this guy? I mean, he looks like a terrifying character. He got away with these raging videos, uh, whereas other people in Russia never would have done. This presumably is due to a, uh, his closeness with Putin, but that closeness is now very much ruptured, hasn't it? You're right about the closeness with Putin. The other thing I noticed from that was the number of, of blanking outs that went on. Um, I think if we, if we, you know, if we, you know, this has been an adult TV program, <laughs> there'd be more Fs and Cs and almost anything else yeah. in there. I mean, he did a lot of swearing uh, it, 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 in there. I think it's worth reflecting that actually Putin used him. Putin used him as a kind of a sort of ginger group in order to try and put pressure on his own generals. Putin had, was clearly told a story uh, in February last year uh, that you know, a bunch of neo-Nazi drug takers in Ukraine could be knocked over in a, in a very short coup d'etat by various agencies, and, that failed, for they, and they failed miserably in, in so doing. And they've basically been in catch-up mode uh, ever since. So he used um, the, the, the Wagner group not only as kind of shock troops in order to... Um, to try and achieve breakthroughs that his armies had failed so to do, but also as a way of putting pressure on the military to do better. And so that was the kind of picture that was being used. So to some extent, Putin, he was very much and always was Putin's thing, but he actually, Putin was using him in order to try and, as I said, to, to create some momentum uh, and create pressure on the military to, to do better. Um, it's backfired. Uh, it certainly has. It's a strange situation, isn't it, where, you know, a, a nation, Russia, goes to war with Ukraine and then kind of employs, hires, if you like, a mercenary army, also from Russia, uh, and pays this guy, Prigozhin, you know, to uh, help the, the official Russian forces. And now uh, that uh, kind of duality has turned into a kind of schism. And now... Uh, uh, Prigozhin is marching towards Russia. I mean, what on earth, Simon, is Prigozhin's game plan? What is is he? Does he really think he can get to the Kremlin and unseat uh, Putin and take control? He, he's probably telling himself and probably trying to tell his people at the moment that Putin is somehow still a good leader. Um, and that all he needs to do is remove the kind of evil counsellors who are around him. And, you know, and history is replete with those sorts of stories. We can look into our own history. Um, you know, coup leaders right back into the Middle Ages would tell their people that the king was surrounded by evil counsellors. And if he only had to get rid of them and everything would be fine. And that's probably the kind of story that he's telling himself, as I say, telling his, his people around him. Uh, and then you suddenly find actually that, you know, that the king is still there and then you're the man on the wrong side of the, uh, of the beheader's axe. So I think that's that's kind of where it, where it, it, uh, it's it, it's heading for uh, for him. Um, I the, the the really interesting thing would be though is whether he has uh, any strong allies within the very large Russian military and security establishment. We do know that the Wagner Group has been linked with the GRU. Now the GRU is um, is the the military intelligence organisation, uh, and throughout there have been the organisation who at least notionally have been giving them orders, giving them direction, and particularly giving them orders and direction in some of the activities that the Wagner Group have been operating on overseas. Now the GRU as an agency is one of those that's been so badly caught out during the in the fight and describing what was going to happen in Ukraine. So institutionally they are on the on the back foot. Uh, whether they have any other people they can use, whether they'll be elements of the Russian armed forces who would come on side with the Wagner group, that's clearly what's going to be worrying Putin um, and see whether uh, any of the, any of the, say, the Russian military decide to throw their hat in with uh, Prigozhin or, or stick with, the, with, with Putin. And that's what we're worrying Putin at the moment. Uh, so uh, 
Prigozhin uh, says he's taken the city of Rostov on Don, which is a southern city not too far from Ukraine, uh, from the Donbass region, uh, and then uh, marched on to Voronezh, uh, where I think we've seen at least one explosion, an explosion yeah. at a uh, an oil base there. So the, some of the footage coming out of this conflict is uh, dramatic, to say the least. But what we've got here, Simon, it would strike me, uh, is the makings, potentially, of a kind of civil war in Russia. That, that is entirely possible. What I think it will also do, it will also remove the aura of invincibility around Putin. So even if he's able to suppress this particular revolt, um, Putin is an autocrat, he's not a, a, a dictator, he's an autocrat. So basically, he has to balance various power interests, political interests, uh, economic interests, military interests, and try and keep everybody happy. So even if he does succeed in in, uh, in suppressing this particular revolt, there'll be other people who say, actually, the regime is not quite as strong as it looked before. Uh, and, and so it's the, the, if you like, the cracks will have appeared uh, in the regime. And that's a very dangerous time for Putin as well. So Putin will obviously try and do what he's best to try and suppress this quickly. But I think it tells us something quite fundamental about Putin and his regime. Uh, this is not invincible. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, able to withstand uh, everything. Uh, and it could be... It could be um, it could be knocked over. That does actually make it, though, very dangerous because if he's if he's on his back foot, if he's under pressure, then that's when he might decide to do something particularly stupid. Uh, that was going to be my next question. As we watch uh, these scenes uh, in Russia, as we watch the Russian capital mounting, staging up uh, machine gun posts to protect itself uh, from its own people uh, in the Wagner Group, uh, what will the world be thinking? What will America be thinking about this? What, will, what are we thinking? How will we around the world react to what seems to be a kind of a beginnings of a disintegration domestically in Russia? I think most sensible people would be would deeply concerned. However opposed we are to Putin and his war in the Ukraine, there's something about understanding Russia and, and the great the great story about Russia, you know, is you know it's a it's a mystery, you know, wrapped up in an enigma, wrapped up in, in, in everything else. I mean the, the Babushka model, which we're all familiar with, is 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 the is the kind of if like the principal theory that describe describes Russia. Uh, and so when one bit of that, particularly an internal bit, or a bit close to the center, appears to be disintegrating, uh, then it's very unclear what's happening before. There's also a country which uh, is not used to this. I mean, during the Yeltsin's time, uh, there was an attempted coup then, um, and then that was suppressed. But, you know, this country itself has been relatively stable, is a relatively stable country, does not have a big history of coups and counter coups. You know, this is not Latin America. Uh, it's nuclear armed, it's got nuclear allies, um, and it's got all of those things going on, and it's it's now clearly unstable. That's got to be concerning to a lot of people. And I mean, this is a you know wars, uh, losing wars. The signals from losing wars. You know, of course, they can take place on the battleground. You can see the forces of Russia not doing very well in the Ukraine. We've seen footage of soldiers running. You know, uh, we've seen uh, s footage of Ukrainian successes. So that's one sign that uh, an army or a country is not doing very well in a conflict. But the other sign is always domestically, where things begin to fall apart domestically. Uh, so what we're seeing in Russia now, this could be very, very significant, could it not? Could it be a sign that people all over Russia are now doubting Putin, that they think he has taken them into a, uh, a, a folly of a war uh, that has proved to be disastrous. Do you think that's uh, a, uh, an escalating feeling among the people of Russia? I think I think it is. I mean, he's, there's been a significant amount of what you might call information control, particularly strategic information control within Russia. Uh, and I understand just looking at very quickly at the at some of the the, the ports that were coming through. Um, a lot of the internet communicators in in Russia have been taken down. Um, so um, the ability of the Russian people to get their own information sources through Google, through Wikipedia, or whoever, um, have, uh, has, been, has been limited. Nonetheless, information does get through and does get through to people. Um, casualty lists we know have been suppressed, um, and in many cases people didn't even know their soldiers were fighting, uh, their, their sons and daughters were fighting before they you know, basically were told, well, your son and daughter you can collect him from the railway station because he's dead. You know, that level of real, really utterly crude and vile sort of you know disinformation has been has, has been going on um so it may take a bit of time for the sort of full um 
awfulness as far as Putin's concerned of this and and the danger of this to actually filter down to people but it will filter down to people and people will understand and they'll actually it shows if you like the level of corruption the level of incompetence uh, and just actually as i said how fragile really and this autocratic regime is it may have the guns it may have the bullets but it basically depends on the will and the whim of you know a dozen different people uh, who have intermittent access to to putin uh, and then when that fails, what's going to happen to the country? That would be very disturbing to a lot of people. Um, I understand, Nina, again, an indicator, uh, all flights out of Moscow can't be completely booked. Anybody who can get out is getting out. Uh, and again, that's the kind of message that, that very quickly spreads and is heard by many people around the country. Yeah.